Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us online this morning. A quick, I guess, update. big announcement or a yeah. big update <laughs> is uh, we're moving all our online to the united.church.online website. Facebook is changing things up a little bit, so we're not going to be premiering on Facebooks, uh, Facebook, but mm -hmm. we are going to Facebooks. <laughs> There's multiple of them that you can put your faces in. Facebook, but we are going to be at the church online, and that, that link should be here at the bottom of the screen, just so you know. But I also kind of dig it, because everybody that's watching online can all watch online at the same place at the same time. Uh, one venue, and you're not kind of moving around to different venues. Mm -hmm. Plus, our at the movies is only we're only you know broadcasting yeah. it on this site. So just keep that in mind. We'll have some stuff going out over uh, email and some different ways, and on our website to let you know what's happening. But we're going to one official online place, and hopefully, it'll be super super awesome. Yeah. So we're excited. We're in week two of Mountains and Valleys. So Did you, and you like it? That was a great word. I love being on the mountaintop, but you know what? Sometimes we're in the valleys, and so we're excited to hear what Pastor Adams got to preach about the valleys that we might find ourselves in. Yeah. <laughs> we love you. God is for you. Let's pray, and uh, let's get into the word. Lord, we love you. Thank you for today. I thank you for each and every person watching. I pray, Lord God, that you would touch their heart so much that they would be encouraged to take a next step, whatever that looks like for them, whether it's connecting with us, whether it's coming back to church in person, whether it's reaching out for a free Bible, no matter what it is, Lord, I pray that you would encourage them and inspire them to get more of you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Let's go. <laughs> Hey, good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us online this morning. We're in uh, week two of a two-part series that we're calling Mountains and Valleys, and last Sunday we spoke about the mountains that we all have to climb, that we're all called to climb. Come on, somebody. Every single one of us in this Christian walk, in this Christian journey, are called to climb some mountains. But how many know that as you climb mountains, at particular moments, you find yourself in valleys. Come on, somebody. As you climb mountains at particular times in your ministry or in your life or in this Christian journey, you find yourselves in valleys. But I want to give you some good news right from the start. The, the Bible says in Psalm 23, verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. The first valley that I want to talk to you about is, uh, as we go through uh, just a couple of valleys, a couple of known valleys in the Bible, just because I want to stir up your faith. I want you to see how these men and women in the Bible encountered mountains like we spoke about last week, right? We used some biblical characters, like little biblical characters that climbed mountains to illustrate what those mountains would mean in our lives. I want to do the same with some valleys. Come on, somebody, some valleys that you might face in your life. And the first valley that I'm talking about is the Valley of Achor, and that has to do with Joshua. In Joshua 7, verses 25 and 26, it says, Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burnt them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from his fierceness of anger. Therefore, the name of the place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. And the first valley that I want to talk to you about, come on somebody, is the Valley of Distraction. The Valley of Distraction. And Joshua was called by God to be a great general. Come on, somebody. Joshua was called by God to lead men and women after Moses to the promised land, to the place that God had called him to. He was second in command, if you will, behind Moses. And God ordained Joshua to do something awesome, but he was surrounded 
by distractors. Come on, somebody. By men and women that said it's too hard. We'll never make it. We'll never get there. We don't have enough. We can't do this. There's giants in the land. We look like grasshoppers in our own eyes. There was just a million different things that we're trying to distract Joshua. But I want you to know this morning that Joshua made it through. I want you to know this morning that you're going to make it through. You're called by God to be more than a victor, not a victim. Come on, somebody. You're called to be a victor, not a victim. And we might go through stuff. Stuff might happen. But God has blessed you and placed you. And where God has placed you, he's going to grace you. He's going to have his grace and his mercy and every good thing abound around your life. You just have to accept it and be obedient to what God has called you to do. Despite the distraction, Joshua could have stayed in the valley of Achor. He could have stayed. There were so many haters around him. There were so many people causing distraction around him that he could have stayed there. He could have said, guys, you're right. Guys, this is the best. Guys, we're never going to be able to do more than this. Guys, this is the best that God has for us. Guys, this is the promised land. He could have started making all the excuses that we normally make, but he knew what God had spoken to Moses. He knew that what God had spoken to him, and he held on to the promises of God in the face of distractions. I want you to know that we're all going to go through the Valley of Achor. We're all going to go through the valley of distraction, but God has qualified you. He's equipped you to keep moving. You, the valley is not where you're supposed to stay. Come on, somebody. The valley is not where you're supposed to stay. The valley is where you're supposed to slay. Ooh, that's good. Come on, somebody. That's good right there. That's tweetable right there. The valley is not where you're supposed to stay. The valley, valley is where you're supposed to lay. You got to keep on moving, move past distractions, move past everything that would try to hinder you. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 35. And this I say for your own profit, that not that I might put a leash on you, but for what is proper and that you may serve the Lord without distractions. Come on, somebody. Let go of those things that would try to distract you, that would try to rob your blessing, that would try to stop you from moving out of the valley and get going to where God has called you to be. If you're in a relationship that's inappropriate, it's a distraction and they're slowing you down from being all that God's called you to be. If you're in a position of sin and, and you can't get out of it, you need to get going. It's a distraction and it's trying to stop you and slow you down from being who and being where God has called you to be. The second valley I want to look at is the valley of Eshkol. Numbers 32 verse 9. For when they went up to the valley of Eshkol and saw the land, they were discouraged the heart of the children of Israel so that they did not go into the land which the Lord had given them. You, you can't get stuck in this second valley. It's the valley of doubt. You, you got too many options. Come on, somebody. We're, we're, we're a, a world full of options. We have options all around us. And you know what options become when there's too many? Distractions. And distractions will lead to doubt. I, I, I don't know. This feels good. And, and, and this feels good. And, and this feels right. And and this feels right, and there's so much going around, going on around you. There's so many voices in your head that you begin to doubt. Matthew 11, verse 12, from the days of John the Baptist into now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and the violent take it by force. You got to get moving. John 14, verses 15 through 17. If you love me, keep my commandments. Somebody drop it in the comments below. If you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. And that's the spirit of truth. Come on, somebody. 
We got to get moving out of this valley, the valley of doubt, the valley that we're doubting that God's called us to this, that God's really in this, that God's blessing this. When we went through COVID, we didn't have a place to meet for 18 months. I was living in the valley of doubts. I didn't know if we'd ever get out of this place. I didn't know if we'd ever move another step. I don't know. I didn't know if we'd ever change, if we'd ever grow, if we'd ever go. I was living in the valley of doubt, but I made a decision in my heart that if God called me, then he qualified me and I would keep moving forward. I wouldn't move backwards. I wouldn't move sideways. I'd keep moving forward. Let me tell you something, friends. If the door is open and there's a fire in the house, you don't have to pray to God for an answer. You just need to run. And that was my prayer in my heart. I said, God, if you open the door, I'm not going to question you. God, if you're making a way, I'm not going to question you. I'm not going to question and pray if I need to eat Cocoa Puffs or Fruity Pebbles in the morning. Come on, somebody. I'm going to make a smart decision, but other things like what God's called me to and letting other people stand in the way of it and and hanging in this valley of doubt, I'm just not going to let it happen and you should not either. 2 Timothy 1 verses 5 and 7. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dealt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded it's in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I want to let you know that God has called you from the start. It's so easy to start to doubt. What am I doing here? What's my purpose? I don't know who I am. I don't know who my identity is. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Stir up the gift that's been imparted to you through the laying on of hands. God's called your mama. God's called your auntie. God's called your daddy. God's put something in you. Get out of the valley of doubt and begin to shout. Come on, somebody. Come on, you just got to put it all on the line. Bet on Jesus. Put all your chips on Jesus, and I promise you won't be disappointed. You got, you got, you got to get out of that valley of doubt. You got to move past the valley of distraction. Get right through the valley of doubt. And sometimes the next place we find us in is the valley of Kindron. The valley of Kindron is mentioned a few times in Scripture Most notable, the valley that Jesus traveled through to visit Lazarus at Bethany when Lazarus had died. Jesus also crossed this valley from the Last Supper to the Garden of Gethsemane where he was betrayed by Judas. What does that tell me this valley might be? This valley might be the valley of hurt. And I know that there's a lot of people that are stuck in this valley. There's a lot of people that are living in this valley. If that person didn't have died, if my mama didn't have died, if that person didn't have gone, if I only got there sooner, if I could only do more. The Last Supper when Jesus was going and he was betrayed by Judas. If I had only not trusted that stupid person, if I had not let that person into my life to hurt me and talk to me, I want to let you know that hurt is not meant to hang on to. Hurt is meant to, it's meant to teach us how to grow and go into all that God has for us. Hurt needs to be a momentary thing in the life of a believer. I want to let you know that every time we hang on to hurt, all it does, it it builds a fence around our heart. And that, uh, that fence that it's building is called offense. And it just puts us in a state where we're constantly on the offensive. We don't trust anybody. We don't love anybody. We don't let anybody in. And the Bible says that if you can't trust your brother who you do see, how can you trust God who you can't see? We got to move past this valley of hurt. Psalm 34, 18 says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. There's no better time to come to God than when you're hurt and crushed in spirit. There's no better time to come to church than when you're suffering and you're struggling and you're hurting. There's no better time to come closer to God when it seems like all else is gone. I want to let you know because all else could be gone, but there's still a solid rock to hold on to. 
and his name is Jesus Christ. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose heart are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also covers its pool. They go from strength to strength. I want to let you know that's who you're called to be in Jesus Christ. We're, we're, we're mountain people. Come on, somebody. We're adventurers. We get to the mountain. We go through the valley. We go through the valley. We meet the springs. We refresh ourselves. We get to another mountain. It's the Christian walk. There's ups and downs. We always wanted to be up on the mountaintop. We always want to live there. We always want to stay there. But I want you to let you know that it's in the valley that real strength is produced. I want you to know that it's in the valley that real power is produced. I want you to know that it's in the valley that real perseverance is produced. You'll never appreciate the mountain until you learn how to appreciate the valley. It's the valley of hurt. We got to get through it. God's calling us through it. We got to move past it. We got to move on to who God's calling us to be. The fourth valley I want to talk about is the valley of dry bones. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around and behold, there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, how can these bones live? The fourth valley I want to talk about is a valley of dryness. Maybe you've been walking with the Lord for a while and you just feel really dry. Maybe you've, you've not come back to church. Maybe you've only stayed online and you're, 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 you're partly fellowshipping with people that you want to fellowship with, but you're missing out on something and you feel a little bit dry. Isaiah 58 Verse 11 says, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and it will strengthen your frame. You'll be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Matthew 5 verse 6 says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. I want you to know you have to get a hunger and a thirsting inside of you, not only for God's word, not only for what God says is good, but to be around God's people. He was walking through a valley by himself. The prophet Elijah was walking through a valley by himself, and the only company that he had were some dry, nasty, rusty, dusty bones. Come on, somebody. Some of you are hanging out with people and they're dry, rusty, dusty bones. They have nothing to offer you. They have no encouragement for you. You haven't gotten back into God's house. You're doing life with people that are all wrong and you feel dry. It makes sense when you're hanging out with a bunch of dry bones. But I want you to know that if you hunger and thirst for God, if you seek him like never before, he will quench that thirst with his living Water. He has a spring that never runs out. Come on, somebody. It's the refreshing that comes by participating in kingdom things. Somebody drop that in the comments below. It's the refreshing that comes by participating in kingdom things. Small groups, so important. And come out, be with the ladies, be with the men. Serve days, come out. Serve with your brothers and with your sisters. Stop hiding, stop Stop separating. Stop, stop trying to, to do your own thing and start connecting with other believers that want to grow like you want to grow, grow, that want to encourage you like you need to be encouraged. We need to be around the living water, not the dry bones. Come on, somebody. Not the dry bones. As a matter of fact, one of your call is to revive the dry bones, not participate with the dry bones. Elijah was walking past and he said, bones, you're going to live. He started praying. He didn't lay down in the pile with them and said, I'm going to get real comfortable and we're going to talk through this and we're going to read a book together and we're going to highlight the points and go through it every Wednesday night. He said, bones, live. 
He said, I'm not hanging out with you. I'm not sitting down here. I'm not stopping here. I'm not slowing down here. As a matter of fact, I'm not adapting to your climate. You're going to adapt to my climate. I have the source of living water inside of me. Come on, somebody that fires me up. We have the source of living water inside of us. We should be refreshing people, not quenching people. Ooh, Jesus, that'll preach right there. Some of y'all get around people and you're so sour, you take the, the everything out of, out of people. What about refreshing, renewing, being people of the Spirit that, that refresh others? The Bible actually says in Psalms that those, those who refresh others will be refreshed themselves. You wonder why you're so dry and so lifeless. Because you suck the life out of all the people around you. You need to be a contributor. A contributor to what God is calling you to do. To what God is calling the church to do. Be a source of living water and not a match for those dry bones. Come on, somebody. The next valley that I want to talk about is the Valley of Elah. It says here, Saul and they were, all the men of Israel were in the Valley of Elah fighting the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sleeper, left the sheep with a keeper and took the things and went to Jesse and went as Jesse has, had commanded. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for battle. The fifth valley, the valley of Elah, is the valley of battle. Some of you are in a fight for your life right now, and it's so easy to give in. It's easier to give in than it is to fight. And I want to let you know that God has called you and equipped you to fight. He's not going to put on you anything that you can't bear, but he's going to go with you side by side. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. There's nothing the enemy can throw at you that God can't defend. There's nothing that the enemy can't come at you with that God can't make a way of provision out of. He's building a standard in your life. He's built a standard in your life and you have to trust the process that the God of battle is with you, that he's going before you, that he's a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, bringing provision and protection over your life because you're a king's kid. Come on, somebody. You have the blood of a king flowing through your veins. You're not a wimp. You're not a pushover. You're fit for this fight. You're ready for this battle. You just need to stand on your legs and call out to God, cry out to God, God, I know that you've, you've called me. I know that you're here with me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is against me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's how we should face each day. Each day we're going to face the valley of the battle. Each day we're going to have to go through something. Each day the enemy is going to try to attack us. Each day, people are going to try to get at us. We have to know who we are in Jesus Christ. We have to know who we are in Jesus Christ. The next valley I want to talk to you about is the Valley of Sidim. In Genesis 14, verse 10, now the Valley of Sidim was full of asphalt pits, and the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went on their way. Sodom and Gomorrah represents the valley of sin. But I want to let you know this. In Romans 3, 23, it says, All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. All of us fall short. All of us make mistakes. None of us are perfect. No matter what valley you're in, no matter what you're going through, sometimes we sin in the valley because we feel hopeless, we feel left, we feel afraid and alone. But I want to let you know that you can make it through, that God's calling you to make it through. Nobody is perfect but as long as God's hand is over your life, you're going to make it through. You have to just try to get better. Romans 6.23 says this about sin. 
The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can't stay in sin. Friends, I want to tell you this morning, it's not good for any of us to stay in sin. We have to make a decision in our heart that we're going to move through, that we're going to move past sin, that we're going to push past sin, and we're going to push into all that God has for us. I want to let you know that if you're trying your best, if you're trying your hardest, God sees you. He knows that you're human. He knows that you're flesh and blood. He knows that we're going to make mistakes. Listen to what this says in Romans 8 as I close. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is he even at the right hand of the Father who makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for your sake? We are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Look, I wanna let you know something. You gotta fight sin. You have to fight sin. But I also wanna encourage you in this. We're all gonna slip up. We're all gonna make mistakes. It, it, it matters most what happens next. Nothing can stop God from loving you. Nothing you do can stop God from loving you. So you got to make up your mind now. Are you going to hang in the valley? Or are you going to start clawing and scratching your way to the mountaintop? Because I want to promise you, like I said last week, it's in those mountaintops moments that there's no obstruction that we can see God clearer and clearer. There's always going to be valleys. There's always gonna be mountains, but it's what you do in this moment that matters the most. Don't let your sin define you. Don't let any of these things define you. Let the word of God define your life. Let's pray together. If you're far from God right now and you're saying, hey, I wanna come home, I, I want Christ in my life. Let's pray together this morning. Just repeat after me, say, Jesus, I surrender my heart to you. I ask you to be Lord and savior of my life. I ask that you would forgive me of all my sins and heal my heart. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave for me. Today, I surrender my life to Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, that's all you have to do. You're on your way. But now you need to take next steps. Come to church. Get connected to it with us. Join a small group. Send us your information. We'll send you a free Bible. God is for you. God loves you. Don't go anywhere. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us again online. We're so grateful for the opportunity to come and minister to you. Hey, if you call United Church your home, and you're saying, hey, what's the easiest way I can connect? What's the easiest way to partner? The simplest way is through your giving. Your generosity makes a big difference here in this church. And our vision goes as fast as, as giving does, really. Yeah. Yeah, really. Um, we're just so grateful for those that do call United Church home and have given. We've been able to do a lot with that. We've had serve days. We, um, we feed families, groceries. There are a lot of things that um, we we're have We're getting ready done. for back to school. We're getting ready for it's back, our back to, to school. It's our back to school season. Uh, I know there's going to be a back to school bash mm -hmm. where we're going to serve the, the schools in the community yeah. with whatever needs they have they in the have. school. Yeah. So we usually wait like two to three weeks until school starts. 
We're not a church that says, hey, let's get 20,000 backpacks and give them to the school and, and, and tell them that here, here they go. <laughs> we, we, you normally go to the schools and say, hey, what can you guys use? Yeah. Because we want to be really be a blessing and give you what you guys need, not what you already have. Yeah. So we're gearing up for things like that. But I, I just want to let you know your generosity makes a difference. And giving is a spiritual discipline. It's not just something that we do recklessly. It's not just something we do just to do it. We don't tip Jesus. Come on, somebody. <laughs> we don't just tip the Lord, but we give our first and our best. The Bible actually says there's two different options. The Old Testament talks about the tithe, which is 10% of your gross income. Your first 10%, your first 10, your first best goes to God. In the New Testament, the Bible says they sold everything they had and they gave yeah. it to those who needed so you could pick which one you want to do. Come on, somebody. But either way, your giving makes a difference. We're trying to get the building um, finished. We want to we want to own this building. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. We want to own this building. We want to own this land. We're just getting started with all that God's put in our heart. So we love you. We're so thankful for your giving. Pastor Leslie's going to pray for us. And let's give our first and our best to the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, everybody. Amen. Father, we thank you for this time that we give, Lord God. We thank you for everything that you've given us, and Lord, we give back to you. Father, we give you this 10%. Whatever it is we give you, we ask that you bless it, Lord God, because you know it comes from a cheerful giver. And so, Lord, we thank you for all that um, you have planned for us to do with this, with these finances, and, um, and just let us be your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Love you guys. See you next week. Bring somebody with you.